come back to uh, our third lecture on the uh, area minimizing graphs. So uh, now for this lecture, first of all, quickly, I will prove the Georgi's theorem on the C1 alpha regularity of area minimizing graphs in the interior when they have small excess. Okay, so uh, uh, um, recall our hypothesis. So we have a function u which is going from the unit disk into Rn and graph of u is area minimizing Okay, and then we know that the excess, which is uh, what we call in the following way, so the excess of the graph of u on the cylinder of radius one centered at zero with respect to the horizontal plane is very small, so it's less than, uh, say, some epsilon. Okay, so now fix a point P, which is equal to some x, u of x, and this is inside the cylinder of radius one half. Okay, and P, a ball of radius one half centered on this point. Okay, and now in particular compute the excess in the ball of radius one half and um, of the graph of u, of course. And since the ball of radius one half centered at P is contained in the cylinder, when I compute the excess with respect to this horizontal plane, I get something which is relatively small, so I only get a factor times this, because this excess has a normalizing factor. And then when I minimize overall planes, of course, I get something possibly smaller, so this is going to be less than a constant times epsilon. Okay, so now pick some plane pi, which optimizes this excess. Okay, and by the elementary lemma that we have seen uh, 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 a couple of lectures ago, the difference between this plane pi and the plane pi zero, so the angle between the two of them, has actually to be comparable to the square root of this excess, right? So pi minus pi zero is actually pretty small. Okay, so now inside this ball, we know that if we have epsilon sufficiently small, we can actually pick a cylinder whose base is parallel to this plane pi and it has slightly smaller radius and all the graph inside the cylinder is contained inside my ball. Okay, so this is a cylinder of radius one half, say minus eta. This is center at the point P and then it has, it, it has base pi. Okay, and I mean, when we are using this notation over here, what we mean is that we take a ball of radius one half minus eta centered at the point pi, we intersect it with the cylinder pi, okay, and then we add pi perp to this. Okay, so this is pi and this is pi perp. Okay, very good, and then in the cylinder, what we know is that the excess is very small and there exists, so if we call E this excess over here, right, so that exists a function V uh, um, from the ball of radius one half minus eta centered at P, uh, so this is the disk actually and parallel to pi, so this is a notation that we will use for this object over here, b one half minus eta, and then p is the center point and pi is the uh, plane in which the disk is actually contained into pi perp. 
And this does actually two things. So first of all, the Lipschitz constant of V is less or equal than a constant times E uh, uh, to a power gamma. And the set where V and U are different, well, let's say V and U prime, where U prime is the new function which is giving you the graph in these coordinates, Okay, so this, so the area of this is actually less or equal than a constant, and then e to the power one plus gamma. Okay, so if we make now uh, uh, um, what we have already done before, so first of all, from the proof of the Lipschitz approximation theorem that we had last time, you actually see that since I can patch v and u prime, so although v is not a minimizer, okay, I cannot find the competitor for v which goes in area, which gains in area better than e to the, to the power one plus something, okay? So recall from the Lipschitz approximation, so if z is a competitor for v, well, then the graph, so the m-dimensional volume of the graph of z must be bigger or equal than the m-dimensional volume of the graph of u prime uh, um, uh, minus an error, which was the patching uh, between v and u prime, because v and u prime are not exactly the same function, and this was like one plus, say, some gamma, okay? And of course, then we have also a similar estimate with the graph of v. Okay, on the other hand, we have the Taylor expansion for our uh, excess and for our area. So we know that we know two things. So we know, uh, uh, first of all, that the m-dimensional volume of the graph of V Right, it's approximately uh, the area of the unit disk plus one half the integral over uh, this disk of the energy plus an error which is like e to the power one plus gamma, okay? And then we know something else also, we know that Similarly, the volume of the graph of u prime minus the area of the disk down is also equal to one half the integral of the u prime squared plus big O of e to the one plus gamma. Okay, so this means essentially that since this is almost E, so this is comparable to E, so this means essentially that this indirectly energy is comparable to E, and, and, and if you renormalize the function V by dividing by E to the power one half, okay, so this is comparable to one. Since, however, you minimize the area over there, and the error that you have over here is a constant e to the power one plus gamma, you actually can conclude something which is very interesting, that if you have a competitor for this v divided by e to the one half, in Dirichlet energy, such a competitor can only gain something like e to the power gamma. So if v prime, say, or if g, is a competitor for v divided by e to the one half. So then the Dirichlet energy of g 
okay, has to be uh, bigger or equal than the Dirichlet energy of this V divided by E to the power 1 half plus E to the gamma. Okay, so this is actually telling you that this function V divided by E to the 1 half is very close to be an harmonic function. Okay, and in particular, out of these considerations, it's not difficult to see that there is an harmonic function which is W12 close to this normalized approximating function V with an error which is actually proportional to this E over gamma. But in fact, we don't know that, I mean, we don't need that. What we really need is that there exists an harmonic function H So such that the W12 distance between H and V divided by E to the 1 half, okay, it's a little O of 1. Okay, so where, 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 where this one means just, you know, I, I treat this as, as um, I mean, thinking that I take the excess very small. Of course, this translates into the fact that, it, that, it, that there exists an harmonic function H prime, such that H prime minus V in W12 is a little o of your excess, E, okay? So now, here we have a very simple lemma, which I leave, it, which I leave to you as an exercise. I mean, this is a, a, a semester or a three weeks activity on harmonic analysis, and this is actually a purely harmonic analysis lemma. So if you have an harmonic function H, so if H is an harmonic function, say in the ball of radius, so in the disk of radius sigma, okay, and you pick a tau, which is less than sigma, okay, then you can uh, expand your harmonic function H in uh, spherical harmonics, and you will actually find the following interesting uh, fact. So if I integrate over the Bolovedius tau dH minus the average over the Bolovedius sigma of dH, and I square it, okay, so the energy of this is going to be less or equal than tau divided by sigma to the power m, which is the dimension, plus 2 times the integral of dh squared, okay? So now, I apply this to the uh, h prime, So I apply this to the H prime, and uh, then I apply it actually to, uh, I mean, I, I, I use the fact that H prime is close to V, and I use the, to the fact that V is close to U, and then I will actually derive the following uh, inequality. So in the ball of radius one quarter, if I take D U minus the average of D U squared, okay, so with respect to uh, the ball of radius uh, um, one half minus eta, I will have something like this. So this is going to be less or equal than one half. Uh, okay, so this is going to be less or equal than one quarter to the power m plus two. Okay, and then I'm dividing by uh, one half minus eta to the power m plus two. And here I will have the integral of the u squared. Okay, and then here, I have something which is little o of the excess. Okay, and now it's not too difficult to imagine the following. So if the integral, sorry, du prime squared here. So if the integral of du prime squared was the excess, and here I have b of 1 half minus eta. 
So if the integral of du prime squared was comparable to the excess with respect to the horizontal plane, so now there's another tailored expansion that you have to do, which is telling you that this energy over here is close also to an excess, but an excess where instead of comparing the tangent planes to the horizontal plane, you are comparing the tangent plane to the plane whose graph is given by the average of the u prime. OK? So take the plane pi 1 and which is the graph of the linear function say x prime gets mapped into this average on the ball of values 1 half minus eta of du prime times x prime. So it's a slightly tilted plane. And then conclude conclude that the excess in the so of the graph of u prime, but which is just the graph of u on the cylinder of radius one quarter centered at your point P compared to this new plane pi one. Okay, so this is going to be less or equal than something which is up to this constant eta, essentially one half to the power m plus two. Okay, so modulo errors. So it's something like 1 half to the power n plus 2, and then there's something like a constant times eta, essentially. OK, and then you have the integral of du prime squared, and that's actually the excess of the graph of u in c 1 half minus eta, and then compare to pi, and then here there is a little o of e. OK? So now, remember that the cylindrical excess is not normalized, but the spherical excess is normalized. So when I compute actually the spherical excess, I have to divide by a power uh, m of the radius. So here, this power, the, I mean, if I pass to the spherical excess, this power m is actually eaten by the normalization, but there will be a gain which remains, which is this extra power 2. OK, so if you pass to spherical excesses, you will then find that the excess of the graph of u in b 1 half p, right, with respect to the plane pi 1. But then if I optimize, I get even something smaller. So this is less or equal than 1 quarter plus my eta. And then here, there's going to be the excess. Instead of having it in the cylinder of radius 1 half minus eta, I use the lemma and I compare it to the ball of radius 1 half, which is what I started with. OK, and then I have a little o of e, which is controlled by this over here. And so maybe here I just have to put twice eta. For every eta that you give me, I will choose epsilon sufficiently small so that. OK? Is that b one on the left? Sorry? B1 fourth, yes, sorry. OK, so now what you see over here is a decay estimate, right? So you started that you had a small excess with over here, and actually you find that in the ball of radius 1 quarter, you had excess which has decayed by a factor almost 1 quarter. So I could actually, if I choose my constant correctly, so here I could just say this is 1 divided by 2 to the power 2 minus, say, 2 alpha, OK? So almost 1 quarter. Of course, now, you started with a small excess, and you actually find that in a smaller border, you have even a smaller excess. 
Well, this means that I could actually iterate this idea even on the ball of radius one quarter, okay? And what I, in fact, discover out of this is what is called the Georgi's excess decay. So the Georgi's excess decay actually tells me that under the assumption that I have a small excess, for every p in the ball of radius one half, and for every r, which is less than one half, I actually discover that my excess in the ball of radius r centered at p is actually decaying like a constant times the initial excess in the cylinder of radius one, so let us call it E, and then I have R to the power two minus two alpha. Okay, so now we are essentially done with the C one alpha theorem of the Georgi. If you know something which is called Morey's type decay estimates or Morey lemma or Morey campanato lemma, depending whether you come from Italy, for instance. Um, so we have already seen that this excess, I mean, we have already seen that if, you, if, we, if we stick, um, okay, we have seen some times ago that if we stick the average of the function, right, and we compare the excess, I mean, we, make, we, 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 we compute the excess with respect to the plane which is given by the average of the function, right? So the L2 distance to this average is actually comparable to the excess. So you do the same computation over here, and what you discover is that on the ball of radius R P down in the, in the horizontal plane, if I actually compute the U and I subtract the average of the U squared, this quantity, remember this is actually normalized by a factor R to the power M, so here I can take the average. So this quantity over here is comparable to the excess, say, in twice the radius, because this would be like the excess in the cylinder. And so this one also decays like a constant E r to the power two minus two alpha. Okay, and now Morey's lemma gives you, and I mean, if you don't know what Morey's lemma is, you can actually get a complete proof in the lecture notes. So Morey's lemma now gives you that out of this decay estimate, du is actually C zero alpha. I mean, not only it's C zero alpha, so somehow it's maybe suggestive to take uh, a square root of this. Sorry, it's uh, C one minus alpha. So maybe I should have called actually this one minus alpha, I should have called alpha, okay, no, too late. So you see somehow that, that this one, one minus alpha is related to this exponent, and then you can simply guess that the size of the C one, one minus alpha norm is this e to the power one half, which is the linear estimate which I promised you. And of course, this you're going to have it on the ball of radius one half. Um, very good. Uh, yeah, uh, this average. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Exactly. So this, tell, this is telling you the L2 oscillation of the, of the function in the ball of radius R is comparable to a certain power of R. Okay? And out of this, actually, you, you, I mean, the idea of Morris lemma is that, for instance, out of this estimate, you just discover that the. Um, uh, 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 the averages of the derivatives is actually a convergent series, and it converges with a, with a rate which is exactly this r to the power of one minus alpha. I mean, you're summing geometric series, which is, for instance, is telling you right away uh, uh, there exists a limit of the average at every point. So every point is, for instance, a Lebesgue point for the function du. Okay, and then then you get continuity by similar tricks. Good. So we are right on schedule. So the idea was to spend. The first lecture giving you the introduction, then one hour and a half on the Georgi's uh, theorem, and then one hour and a half on Amgren's theorem. So now um, for the remaining part of this lecture and for the lecture of tomorrow, 
I'm going to give you actually an idea on how you can improve this C1, 1 minus alpha estimates to some C1 beta estimates, to, to, to some C3 beta estimates. So from now on, the goal is actually Algorand's theorem, which would tell you that under the same assumptions, with a purely geometric uh, proof, so purely, well, purely, quote unquote, geometric proof of C3 beta regularity. And in fact, we have a C3 beta regularity, which is, which is kind of the same flavor as uh, um, uh, the one over there. So we will be able to estimate the U in C2 beta in some smaller ball. At the beginning, maybe the ball is going to be much smaller, but then by a covering argument, you can actually get the ball of reduce one half. So say this is going to be some ball of reduce tau, and this is going to be less or equal than a constant, and then e to the power one half. OK, so how am I going to do this? So this is going to be a much more sophisticated construction. And it's taking advantage of one key fact. So it's not taking advantage of the fact that the function du is C1 alpha, but it will take advantage of this kind of equivalent thing. That is, that we have the excess decay. OK, so the idea is the following. So here we have our cylinder. So take this base of the cylinder, this cross section. OK, so I write it over here. And then inscribe inside here a, uh, uh, OK, so maybe make it slightly smaller. So make it uh, the ball of radius 1 half or the disk of radius 1 half. OK, then put inside a square or a cube and decompose the cube in smaller cubes in a grid which has 2 to the n 0 cubes. OK, so let me be more precise with formulas. So take uh, minus sigma sigma to the power m inside the ball of radius 1 half. OK, and I believe that in order to do this, you need to choose sigma to be equal to 1 over 2 square root of m. OK, and then subdivide, subdivide the cube minus sigma sigma to the power m in 2 to the n 0 times m cubes L in a regular grid. OK, so to fix some notation, if L is a cube of the grid, I'm going to use L of L for the side length. So first of all, maybe, uh, 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 OK, let me be slightly more precise. So subdivide minus sigma sigma to the power m in 2 to the k m cubes. And k is an integer which is bigger or equal than n0. OK, so this is a regular cube, uh, grid of fine, uh, which is rather fine as k somehow is, is rather large. And uh, call ck the collection of such cubes. OK, so now for each L in CK, OK, let XL be the center of the cube. We let PL be equal to XL U of XL. So the point of the graph of the function U, which is lying on top of XL, 
and let also L of L be the side length of the cube, which should be 2 to the minus k times 2 sigma. OK, so this is the side length of the cube. Uh, now, maybe in the notes I take half the side length actually for L of L. Well, it doesn't matter somehow. This factor 2 is certainly not disturbing. OK, so now here I have my cube. So here's the point XL. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to go up, pick up the point PL, OK, and then I take a ball which is centered on PL, on the whole space, which I will call BL. So BL is going to be the ball of a certain radius. So there is a certain constant, M0, times L of L. And then this is centered on the point PL. Uh, maybe that is square root of M over here. OK, M0 is just sufficiently large. It's a constant which I will fix together with this n0. In fact, the purpose of n0 is to be sure that this ball is contained in the cylinder of radius 1. OK, so this m0 will be decided at a certain point. It's actually a fixed geometric constant. And this gives the ball, which is kind of, of a certain factor larger than the side length of the cube. And then I will choose the fineness of the grid sufficiently large so that Although I'm enlarging the side length of the cube by a certain factor, the corresponding ball is still on the cylinder of the edges one half. OK? OK, so now before I get messed up with the notation, maybe it's time to that I take a look at the uh, lecture notes. Maybe also drink my tea. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Right. So. Very good. Now, I have D the Georgi excess decay, which is telling me very well this the excess of the graph of u in my ball BL is actually decaying, OK? And it's decaying like a constant. Then the side length of the um, uh, 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 cube, which is comparable to the radius of the ball, to the power 2 minus 2 delta, some delta. So now at a certain point, I will want this delta actually to be sufficiently small. And what I know by the Georgi excess decay is that the smaller I want delta, the smaller I have to choose my initial excess in the initial cylinder. Okay? So this is related to this eta error that we were having in the excess decay. So the smaller we wanted eta, the more we had to take the epsilon small in the previous proposition. Okay? So this delta is now a fixed